Okay, so continue on with chapter 24. Um, we're done talking about the life cycles um, and the phylogeny of fungi, and now we're just going to go over um, phylogy um, and then some commercial uses um, for fungi. Okay, so just a little bit left of the chapter. So first of all, already, fungi are crucial to ecosystems, to pretty much every ecosystem on the planet. They're found in most habitats, however, they prefer dark, moist, cool conditions. However, they can grow in light, um, and uh, they can also be found in aquatics. They can be found in the tundra. They can be found inside or on top of other organisms growing in the skin or um, in, inside of the actual tissue of organisms. They can be found in dry, sandy soil or moist, wet soil. Really, they can be found everywhere. But again, they're going to thrive in dark, cool, damp, slightly acidic conditions. Okay, Most members are going to be found on the forest floor, living on dead, decaying matter. And again, these fungi, these saprophytic um, fungi, are going to play a major role in ecosystem. They're going to be decomposing and recycling essential nutrients back into these ecosystems. Okay, so again, what are they putting back into the soil? Lots of stuff. Um, in particular, trace elements like nitrogen and phosphorus. These are elements that are not found in huge quantities um, that are really important to soil health. And so um, what, when fungi break down dead decaying matter, they're gonna take nitrogen and phosphorus from those organisms and put those nutrients back into the soil. So very, very important. Um, in these particular photos, we've got bracket fungi, right, or shelf fungi, growing, um, looks like on a tree. That tree might be dead here. Um, if it's not dead, then this might be a parasitic fungi, okay? Um, or it might be some type of a symbiotic relationship. Not really sure what the species is. Okay. So let's talk about some relationships. So um, mutualistic relationships. So first of all, symbiotic relationships are going to be the interaction between two organisms that live together. Now the term symbiosis doesn't mean it's a positive or a negative relationship. Symbiosis just means that there's a relationship there. Okay. If it's a mutual mutualistic symbiotic relationship, that's going to be a relationship in which both participating organisms benefit from the interaction. Fungi form lots of mutualistic relationships um, with many different types of organisms, including cyanobacteria, those are um, photosynthetic bacteria, as well as um, algae, some plants, and even some animals. We're going to take a look at a couple of examples. So first off with plants, um, the most common mutualistic relationship between fungi and plants are structures called mycorrhizae. These are associations um, that happen underground between um, the roots uh, of a plant, vascular roots of a plant, and the fungi that's living there amongst the roots. Um, both organisms will benefit. When we look underneath the soil at plant roots, we actually find that about 80 to 90 percent of the plants on our planet have these mutualistic symbiotic relationships with fungi. So how do they benefit? Well, the fungus, as it's growing within the root system, it's going to actually increase the surface area, um, which causes an increase in water and mineral uptake from the soil. So essentially, the plant helps the roots to obtain water and minerals uh, from the soil. Okay, how does the fungus benefit? Well, the fungus benefits because the plant does photosynthesis and therefore supplies the fungus with food. The fungus doesn't harm the plant in any way and the plant doesn't harm the fungus in any way. Both organisms will benefit. Okay, lichens, my favorite. So with lichens, again, this is another mutual relationship. This is between a fungus and a photosynthetic organism, either an algae or a cyanobacteria. And in this, the fungus is going to supply minerals, protection from desiccation or drying out, protection from excess, 
and it will also adhere um, the algae or the cyanobacteria to whatever it's growing on, okay? The algae or cyanobacteria is going to do photosynthesis, and therefore it provides food. Um, it also fixes carbon, so it, it provides a carbon source. Um, and food can also be used, we know, for energy, okay? So without the algae or the cyanobacteria, um, the fungus would not its own food and therefore uh, would die, okay? Um, lichen comes in a variety of colors and textures. It can be found in a variety of different habitats. Um, so here's some figures. So hopefully you can see here. Um, I think this is a headstone. Um, so it's it's concrete pretty much. And all of the fuzzy, uh, fuzzy stuff on there, it's not moss, that's lichen, okay? Um, here in this figure, this looks kind of um, fibrous. Um, it's kind of uh, thicker and um, yeah, like like fibrous. <laughs> um, that's lichen there. Okay, it's uh, obviously growing on a tree. Um, I I encourage you guys to get out over the over the weekend or over the week and take a walk through um, you know any park. I, I walk through a Valley View Golf Course. Our trees are covered in lichen. Um, a lot of the lichen that I see looks more like this, um, more of like a, a crusted kind of overlapping of little leaflets, uh, oftentimes growing on bark, okay? You can find lichen growing on pretty much anything. Um, the more lichen there is, um, they say that the better the air quality is. So lichen growth um, is a really good indicator of, uh, of air quality. I thought I actually put that somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> okay, it might be on a slide coming up. So we know that fungi form mutualistic symbiotic relationships with plants and with algae and cyanobacteria. Um, how about animals? So here's a great example. Um, this is the leafcutter ant. And there's actually a lot of YouTube videos showing this guy as well. So go ahead and check those out if, if you can. Um, so again, many uh, fungi will form relationships uh, with insects in the phylum Arthropoda. Um, arthropods are going to use fungi sometimes for protection from predators and pathogens. Uh, and the fungus uh, will also obtain um, nutrients and it will be aided in spore dissemination. So both the animal, the arthropod, as well as the fungus uh, is going to benefit there. Um, so in this example down here at the bottom with the leafcutter ant, um, these leafcutter ants are going to central in South America, and they literally kind of farm the fungus. It's kind of neat. So the ant that you see here in the picture has cut um, a disc um, of a leaf, and it's carrying that disc, and it's going to take that leaf back to where it lives, and it's going to create kind of a, um, a, a mound of these leaf uh, clippings, these leaf discs. And the fungus is going to be growing on this mound of leaf discs or growing on and into, okay? So what the ant is doing is it's bringing its fungus its dinner, okay? So again, it's kind of like it's farming. Um, so the fungus eats the leaves. The ant provides the food, okay? It provides the leaves. So what does the ant get from the fungus? Well, the ant actually eats the fungus. So the ant is growing its own food. Um, so the fungus benefits in that it's provided with protection from the ant and with a constant supply of food from the ant. And again, the ant is going to um, is going to eat the fungus. Not enough to kill the fungus, uh, but it's just going to eat you know, some of it. The fungus still lives. Okay. So those were some mutualistic symbiotic relationships. Um, but there are other types of symbiotic relationships as well. So the first one on here, um, parasitism. In parasitism, again, you have two, two organisms uh, living together. One member is going to benefit at the expense of the other. So one is harmed. Um, you've probably heard of parasites, pathogens. They harm the host. Okay, uh, Pathogens will cause disease as well. 
Commensalism is our third type of relationship, symbiotic relationship. And this is when one member benefits, the other's not harmed, but the other doesn't, doesn't uh, benefit. So it, the other member is not affected at all by the relationship. Okay, so let's look at some plant parasites and pathogens. See in this figure here, so we've got oranges up here in the, oops, sorry. Oranges up here in this first figure. This is right out of your book. You can see that orange is covered in a fungus, um, definitely breaking down uh, the orange. I don't know if you can see this too good, but this is a flower that's been covered in this kind of powdery mildew. That's, that's a fungus. Here we've got um, uh, grapes that are growing, and one of those grapes is covered again by this powdery mildew. And I'm not sure if you can see this, but here's some, uh, looks like wheat um, that's probably covered by some type of a rust or smut. Okay, so a lot of fungi um, uh, will grow on or into um, tissue, in this case it's plant tissue, causing damage and maybe even eventual death of the host plant. Um, some will spoil crops by producing toxins. Uh, causing rotting of stored crops. Obviously the, the grapes and the orange are definitely rotting. <laughs> They're literally being overtaken uh, by the fungi. Okay, so again plants um, can be parasitized by fungi. Animals can also be affected by fungal uh, or pathogens. Um, so if a an animal or a human is uh, ends up with a uh, fungal disease from and call that infection a mycosis. Okay, um, that's a fungal disease caused from infection, and there's different severities of mycoses, and we'll we'll talk about those um, a little bit. Um, if you eat food uh, that has fungal toxins, those are called mycotoxins, and you end up poisoned from that food containing toxins, we say that you have a mycotoxosis. Um, if you ingest toxins uh, from a poisonous mushroom, if you actually eat the mushroom when there's poisonous toxins inside of those, don't do that. That's called a mycetimus, okay? Um, now some people, if they're just around you know, fungi that are not parasitic or pathogenic, um, they could still have allergies um, to fungi or to fungal products. Okay, they might have sensitivities to that. Fungal infections in animals or even in plants, um, they're difficult to treat. Fungal infections, um, fungi themselves are eukaryotic, just like the cells of both plants and animals. And so we don't have a lot of medications that are effective as well as safe to use to treat these types of infections. So for example, antibiotics don't work because fungi are not bacteria, right? Antibiotics only work on bacteria. So they're a little bit difficult to treat and the drugs that we do have to treat them have a lot of side effects, okay? Um, we do have some treatments though for uh, some fungal infections, just not all. So let's take a look at some fungal infections um, that we see in um, humans or in, or in other animals. So first off, many fungal infections are what we call superficial, which means that they occur on the skin, okay, or in the skin. Um, and they're not, they don't go deep into any tissues, underlying tissues. They stay at the level of the skin. So if we have a fungal infection, that occurs in the skin, we call it a cutaneous mycosis, okay? Um, these could be not a big deal, or they can be terrible, depending on what the fungus is and what organism it's affecting. So for example, um, of, so, of a devastating um, cutaneous mycosis, if we take a look at the world's frog population, frogs are, um, going to be susceptible to a cut cutaneous mycosis caused by a fungal species. And if we take a look at the skin of a frog, um, that skin is, 
is essential to gas exchange. Okay, so in order for a frog to take in oxygen and, and get rid of carbon dioxide, its skin is going to be critical um, to that process. And so a cutaneous mycosis on the skin would affect that gas exchange and can actually inhibit gas exchange, leading to death. Okay, and what we found is that this is happening worldwide um, to frogs, and there's there's been a huge decline uh, in the world's frog population from this. Um, here's another example. So bats, uh, more than a million bats in the United States have been killed by a fungus that causes something called white nose syndrome. And what that is, is it's a white ring around the mouth of the bat that's caused by a fungus. It's a cutaneous mycosis. And once one bat has this, they bring it back to the bat cave and it spreads like wildflower. All the, you know, all the bats will have it. Um, and again, it's going to inhibit respiration. Uh, and it could lead to death. Okay, so again, uh, over a million bats in the United States have been killed. And you might think, well, I don't like bats anyways. Bats are keystone species. Um, they're going to be really, really important uh, in the ecosystems um, uh, in which they live in. Um, so if you lose a bat, you know, if you, if you lose a bat species uh, or a bat population, um, you're really going to have major uh, effects uh, ripple through that ecosystem. It can be very, very dangerous. Uh, here's an example here in the picture of a human cutaneous mycosis, and some of you may have had this, ringworm. Ringworm is not caused by a worm. Um, it's caused by a fungus, okay? Or maybe you've had athlete's foot or jock itch. Those are other common um, fungal cutaneous infections, right? They're only skin deep. Uh, most of these are pretty easily treated with creams or, or powders, and they usually clear pretty easily. Okay, again, very, very common cutaneous mycoses uh, affecting just the skin. Okay, so cutaneous mycoses, not so bad for humans, right? But for other organisms, devastating. What about systemic mycoses? So a systemic mycosis is gonna be a fungal infection that is more than skin deep. It spreads to internal organs, usually making its way into the organism's body through the respiratory system. So you're gonna breathe this stuff in, okay? Here's an example. Um, you may have heard of valley fever, which is also called coccidiomycosis. I think I said that right. Coccidiomycosis, yeah, um, also known as valley fever. It's very common in the southwest. Um, fungus, this particular fungus that causes this disease uh, lives in dust. And so again, um, spores inside the dust get breathed in, um, um, into the respiratory system. They end up making their ways way <clears throat> down into the lungs where they start to germinate, grow, um, and they'll, they'll cause... Um, obviously major respiratory problems, <clears throat> kind of similar to tuberculosis. And again, not a lot of fungals here to be able to treat this, so um, can be pretty devastating. Now, if you have a pretty strong immune system, so as long as you're not immunocompromised, usually your, your immune system will fight off um, um, fungi uh, that cause these types of infections. But if you do have a weakened immune system, uh, it might be tough, okay? Here's another one, um, histoplasma capsulitum is a, um, uh, another type of fun fungus that again uh, enters your body through the respiratory system. It causes a uh, pulmonary infection, flu-like symptoms, uh, and it can also lead to swelling of the meninges, which are going to be the membranes that surround the brain and spinal cord. So uh, pretty, pretty nasty, pretty bad infections. And again, the antifungals that are available um, have some pretty serious side effects. So it's really, really hard to treat uh, fungal infections when, they're, when, they're, when they become systemic. Um, cutaneous mycoses are a little bit easier uh, if they're just on the skin. Okay. Okay, just a little bit more. Okay, so opportunistic mycoses. Um, 
We talked about cutaneous and we talked about systemic. Here's our third type, opportunistic mycoses. These are fungal infections that are really common in all environments or that they, they are already part of um, the normal biota. So you already on you or in you, right? So a great example of this is that yeast that we talked about in the very beginning of the chapter, candida. There's different species of candida, um, but you can find candida inside of your mouth. Uh, if you're a female, you can find candida in tract. It's there. It's normal to have this. Um, it's just that it's there in a, in a regulated amount. Okay, there's other organisms there too that they kind of keep each other's growth in check. Okay, however, if you're on an antibiotic or you have a compromised immune system for some reason, then sometimes um, these fungal um, organisms, yeast, uh, will grow out of control. You end up with things like thrush, oral thrush, caused by Canada, or you may end up with a yeast. Again, that's caused by a yeast called Candida, different species of it. Uh, and again, individuals uh, who have compromised immune systems or who are a on antibiotics or um, or there's, there's other reasons as well, uh, they'll end up with an overgrowth of this yeast, which can lead to an infection. And those are usually pretty easy to treat, okay? Um, again, those are called opportunistic mycoses because those organisms were already there. They just happen to grow out of control an actual infection. Okay, I think we already mentioned this. The mycetimus is the ingestion of poisonous mushrooms, and poisonous mushrooms, uh, are they have toxins. And, you know, eating them could, could lead to hallucinations, and that's what some people use these for recreationally. However, they can cause death. So be careful. Be careful if you're going to do that. Okay, or just don't do that. Um, again, my... My college teacher, who used to cook for us and take us out on these forages, he told us some stories about, um, uh, I don't know if he ever said he did it or if he was around people who ingested mushrooms or you may have heard shrooms. Um, and, you know, he'd let us know, as I'm letting you know, that this is poison that you're, you know, putting into your body and um, it may, it may kill you. So you got to be very, very careful. Okay. All right. So how do we use fungi? Did I skip a slide here? No, I didn't. Okay. How do we use fungi to help the human condition? How are fungi important in human life? We know that they cause disease, right? But how do, how do we benefit from them? Well, we've just started to use fungi in as a natural form of pest control. So instead of using... Um, pesticides, chemical pesticides, we're starting to now look at the idea of using biological pesticides. So instead of spraying these nasty chemicals that might be carcinogens and cause all kinds of problems in humans, let's try using a natural way to control pests. And in the past, you know, you may have heard of using like ladybugs as a great pest control mechanism, and I do that in my own garden. But here's another example. Um, there is a fungal species called, and again, I hope I don't butcher the name here, um, Bouveria uh, bassiana, and it's being used and tested as a potential biological pesticide to control this really nasty critter called the emerald ash borer that attacks and kills ash trees. Ash trees. <laughs> um, so here is that emerald ash borer. Um, he bores holes in this tree, which hurts the tree. And you can see he's covered in this white powdery substance. That's the fungus. And the fungus um, grows on it and in it. It's, it's a parasite and a pathogen. Uh, so the emerald ash borer, and it will cause the emerald ash borer to die. So again, humans are starting to try to use fungal species to control pests um, that either hurt other organisms or hurt humans in some way. <clears throat> what else? Well, fungi are staples in our diet. Hopefully you eat mushrooms. They're full of lots of really good nutrition. Many are edible. Um, we even can eat them themselves or uh, fungi are also used in cheese production. Um, fungi, so yeast, are used in making beer, wine, bread. Okay, so they are a staple in our diet. They're also used to make medicines like 
antibiotics like penicillin. Uh, penicillin is made by the Ascomycota penicillium, and there's other antibiotics like cephalosporin that are also made by fungi. Um, fungi are in research organisms, so we use them in the lab to figure stuff out um, uh, about, about us. They can be used to help the human condition or even just about the fungus. Okay, very important biological research organism as well. In fact, when I was an undergrad, um, I worked with um, the yellowy orange fuzzy uh, mushroom, or no, not mushroom, uh, mold called Neurospora prasa, um, which is a key research organism used uh, for many different reasons. I was studying um, biotin uptake, this vitamin, <laughs> and I was using that, that um, fungus to study that. Okay, so here is your Are You With Me? You're going to go ahead and you're going to answer these questions, and then you're going to come back to me, and I have a couple of other questions for you. Okay, so first question, what term describes the close association of a fungus with the roots of a tree? Is it a rhizoid, a lichen, a mycorrhiza, or an endophyte? And hopefully you answered a mycorrhiza green. Remember, that's going to be a mutualistic, symbiotic relationship between a fungus and plant roots. Second question, why are fungi import, important decomposers? Is it because they, grow, because they can grow in many different environments? Because they produce mycelia? Or because they recycle carbon? and in minerals by the process of decomposition. Hopefully you answered yellow, right? So yeah, they definitely recycle carbon and inorganic materials like phosphorus and nitrogen back into the soil by decomposing dead or decaying organic matter. A couple more for you. So a fungus that climbs up a tree reaching higher elevation to release its spores in the wind and does not receive any nutrients from the tree or contribute to the tree's welfare is described a, is this a commensal relationship? Is it a mutualistic relationship? Is the fungus a parasite or is the fungus a pathogen? So the fungus climbs up so that it can release its spores at a higher elevation into the wind, so helping it to distribute itself. And in the meantime, it doesn't get anything else from the tree, nor does the tree get anything from um, the fungus. It's not hurt by it. It's not helped by it. That would be an example of a commensal relationship. And the tree is not hurt or it doesn't benefit either. Okay, so again, that would be commensal. Next question. A fungal infection that attack that affects, sorry, affects nails and, and skin is classified as would that be a systemic mycosis, a mess, a superficial mycosis, or a mycotoxosis? And hopefully you answered superficial, right? Um, only cutaneous, only on the surface. Just skin, we would use cutaneous because nails is there. We would say superficial. So on the surface. Ooh, another one. Got a lot here. The targets for antifungal drugs are much more limited than antibiotics or antiviral medications. Why? So in red, there are more bacteria and viruses than fungi, or blue. Fungi can only be targeted during sexual reproduction, while bacteria and viruses can be targeted at any point in their lifespan. Green. Fungi cause topical infections, while viruses and bacteria cause systemic infections. Or yellow. Human cells are much more similar to fung fungal cells than bacteria or viruses. So the answer here would be yellow. Remember that both fungi as well as 
our human animal cells, are going to be eukaryotic, and they're very, very similar. If we compare um, our cells to bacteria and, and um, viruses, they're very different. But again, comparing uh, human cells to fungal cells, we've got so many similarities that it's hard to find drugs to target uh, fungal cells without having human cells injured in the process. Okay, yeast is a facultative anaerobe. This means that alcohol fermentation takes place only if, red, the temperature is close to 37 degrees Celsius, blue, the atmosphere does not contain oxygen, green, sugar is provided to the cells, or yellow, light is provided to the cells. You gotta think back to General Biology 1, chapter six, I believe, um, no, seven. When we did cellular respiration, we talked about fermentation. And also take a look at that term there, facultative anaerobe. Okay, so first of all, a facultative anaerobe can um, exist, that can do cellular respiration pretty much, in the presence or absence of oxygen. Okay? Um, alcohol fermentation is an anaerobic process, which means... Uh, it's going to take place without oxygen. And so in order to get yeast to do alcohol fermentation, you got to eliminate oxygen. Because if oxygen is present, then the yeast is going to do cellular respiration, aerobic, and not alcohol fermentation. So the answer here would be blue. Um, yeast are only going to do alcohol fermentation if they're in an environment that does not contain oxygen. Okay, that's it. That's the last slide. So you want to go ahead and make sure that you've got all of your Are You With Me's answered. And you want to go ahead and upload your Are You With Me's right to Blackboard. And you want to study your vocab, your chapter outline, and your Are You With Me in class uh, work. Look over the PowerPoint presentation again, over the slides, um, and get ready to take that, that quiz, right? You know that you have a quiz. It's somewhere around 20-ish questions. You've got 45 minutes to complete it, and don't forget you have two chances with the highest chance being counted. Okay.